Hi. <laughs> um, we have a beer that I think that they're going to taste. Does anyone know if it's... Uh, maybe it'll come, maybe it won't. Yeah, let's see. And then how do I... Okay, so anyway, so I'm Nick. Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> good, good. Um, so I'm just going to kind of chat to you guys a little bit about who we are as a brewery, what we do, some of the interesting things um, that we focus on, and some little interesting projects that you guys might find amusing. Um, like you said, we're a very small, um, very like specialty focused brewery. It's, it's outside of Franschuk, so it's in the Winelands. Um, for us, part of kind of our mission, which I think a lot of people in this room share, is to really make amazingly world-class, unique South African beer. So part of our little craft beer community here in this country is not only about you know, creating jobs and kind of changing the industry and starting small businesses, but um, we, you know, we aspire to put like our own mark on the beer world, so our own like South African mark. So we have an incredible wealth of um, raw materials and unique things right here in South Africa that are unlike anything else in the world. We grow barley, we grow hops, we've got Feinboss, we've got um, traditional African beer, we've got literally sorghum. Um, there are few places in the world that you have such an abundant resource base that's, that's so unique and so different. And so part of what we do um, is really try to showcase these local ingredients and try to make uniquely South African beers that are unlike anything in the world. Um, so one of the beers that we've, um, and if, look, if you guys have questions or anything, just stop me and I'll answer questions. We can make it kind of conversational, you know. Um, anyway, so one of our beers that we, um, you know, kind of hang our hat on as one of like our main beers is this beer called Live Culture. Um, so this beer this year won Best Beer in Africa at the African Beer Cup, which was very exciting for us because it, it gets you a lot of press and we're this tiny little business, you know, so like we're in the paper and stuff, which is, um, you know, it means a lot to us. Uh, so it was very exciting. But I think what was most exciting for me personally as a brewer was to see a beer like this win, you know, against all the other beers. So a mixed culture, wild fermented beer that we dry hopped with Feinboss, that we malted our own grain, that has indigenous yeast to it. So something that's really unique and kind of tells that story of South African ingredients, um, for that to come out on top was really exciting for us. Um, so uh, anyway, so that's kind of, so that anyway, so we'll, I'm just gonna kind of talk a little bit more about like what we're doing, what we're about, what our brewery, and then I'll go back to like the details of this beer too, but you guys can taste and then I'll, I'll take you through the tasting notes. Um, have you guys had wild or sour beer before? Most people have, okay, cool, okay, cool. So you won't be that shocked, you know? Um, yeah, so this is a picture of uh, our brewery. So it's it's built within an old wine cellar. So it was it was originally called the Drakenstein Cooperative Winery. So the place was built in 1906 um, as a winery co-op. So you know this was like bulk cheap wine. Like it's not like this like fancy um, you know Franschick thing. Um, so you know the farmers would come in, they'd make their wine, they'd sell it for a few rand, and then they'd grow it again next year. Um, in the 80s, they uh, got rid of the quota system for the grapes, which which had a big impact on the economics of these co-ops. And so the, the the winery closed, but then they were renting it out as kind of bulk wine storage since then. Um, and then they, anyway, then the liquor guys told them that they couldn't store all this wine there. So then that's when the idea of a brewery came in. And um, so we opened in the very end of 2017. And so we've been going for about five years now, which is a lot of fun. Um, but so you can kind of see we, we focus a lot on these beers like this, like these mixed culture, barrel aged, wild fermented beers. Um, for us, uh, they're incredibly exciting, incredibly intense in flavor, but also there's a certain amount of drinkability from the dryness, from the acidity. Um, so it's a beer that you can sit and contemplate and you know explore the meaning of life over, or it's a beer that you can just have uh, casually over conversation. Um, and so for us, like, like that's a big part of who we are as a brewery. And it's, it's a really fun time to be doing that because it's, um, it's very new to all South Africans. Like these types of beers, it's a different kind of flavor profile. It's something very different, but you know, we, we love being part of trying to educate people and say, look, this is amazing. Like this is such a cool beer. Like let me tell you about the fermentation and the aging and then try to get people to get behind these stories and the flavors in the beer. Um, so for us, like, it's just, it's exciting. And it, it creates a challenge, and it's, 
you know, they're not huge volume sellers, but like they're very special and dear to our heart. And it's kind of something that we're, we've become kind of known for and, and um, um, a little bit of a specialization for us. So um, yeah, questions so far? Okay, good, okay. We can shout at the end too. Um, okay, so what we, what, uh, kind of what Troy was alluding to, but we get these questions all the time because I, I don't know if you guys can tell, but um, I'm not South African. I'm from the States originally, this <laughs> accent going on, you know? Um, and it, you know, we, uh, the question we always get all the time is like, what's this American oak doing here in South Africa? And um, this is really the reason why. So um, I truly believe that beer is changing the world. Beer will change the world. Um, and it's, it's changed my life. I've been in beer literally my entire adult life. I will never leave beer. I'll always be in beer. Um, and so for us, it's about telling those stories and really like sharing and trying to give back and like the life that beer has given me, we want to try to give to other people in this country too. Um, so yeah, it just, you guys are kind of starting your journey and like a lot of the speakers have talked about in the beer industry, but I, I don't know if you can already tell, but it's very much, it's a, it, it is a brotherhood and a sisterhood and a community. And that was something that really attracted me to it from a very early time in the industry. Um, so I, like a lot of you guys, I started homebrewing in college, um, and then I was fortunate enough to, to get accepted into this like brewing program, and then that one was really, I kind of was molded more of like a professional. From like a homebrewing standpoint, you kind of think you know everything, and like all these beers that you make with um, honey and stuff is so good, but um, it's really only when you start getting out there and you're talking to people that have been in the industry for 10, 20, 30, 40 years that you really start to understand like the whole breadth and the scope of the business and the scope of the industry and what is possible. And for me, I've, I've always found that very exciting. Like um, I've worked in a lot of different fields in the business and in the industry and I've always, I just, I'm just infinitely curious about what everyone else is doing, what that job is and because just, for me, just it's such an amazing thing. Beer is literally the greatest beverage in the world, and the industry is probably the best business in the world. Um, and I hope as you guys start your careers, you feel the same. Um, so let's see, where am I at? Um, yeah, okay, so here's a picture of me in probably 2005. Um, like I said, so I started as home brewing, um, making in my kitchen, um, yeah, which was very interesting. and. Um, yeah, so anyway, so uh, after brewing school, I went and worked for a large kind of um, regional craft brewery, like outside of New Orleans, called Abita, which is kind of, I would say, it's like bigger than CBC, probably almost the size of like Jack Black or Devil's Peak, like, but which by the American standards, it's kind of medium size, um, but for South African size, it's very big. Um, and that was very interesting to me. Like you learned a lot about processes and fermentation and running the brewery and running packaging and kind of these other things. Um, but uh, I found very quickly, not quickly, but after about a year, um, that I didn't like shift work. I don't know if you guys have ever done shift work, but it's, you know, we, so we had three shifts. So we had 6 a.m. to 2.30 and then 2 to 10. And then graveyard was like from 8 or 10 to 8. Um, and anyway, so I didn't like the shift work, and it, at, at the time, the company I was working at, it, there wasn't that much to do. It, it was kind of like a low ceiling, because the brewmaster wasn't going anywhere. And um, So then I moved into sales in New Orleans, where I was from, um, which was cool. I, I found that very exciting. Like, the sales role is very dynamic. It's very interesting. You, if you get to talk to people all the time, um, and it's very, it's, um, it's competitive in certain ways, um, so if you're you know, of that mind, it can be interesting. Um, then I moved to Washington, D.C., so I covered that kind of territory. Um, and then I went to work for a big distributor, so I saw the distribution side of the business. So that kind of shows you that, like, the industry touches so many different points, but it's all, you know, if you have the passion for beer, like, that passion comes through in every aspect. And for me, I just found it all exciting. I liked learning about the distribution and the logistics. Um, and how you really get, you know, every case of beer to every little shop and every little restaurant. Um, anyway, so yeah, so that was all very exciting. And so then, um, anyway, so then I worked there and I worked in sales for um, another brewery. And then anyway, so then that's when we kind of moved here about 2016, which was um, to start the brewery. Um, let's see, where am I at? So, questions, everybody good? Okay, cool. Okay, so let's talk about the beer. 
Um, so what's very exciting about this beer, this was kind of like our, we have a lot of these little passion projects at the brewery that we, we get a bug in our ear and we, we want to start something cool and we want to start something exciting. And then we never really, especially with the barrel aged beers, you're really looking at like a year to two years. We did like a Lambic type beer that took like four years. Um, so it's, uh, it's very much like you're into it and you, you, you're passionate about the project but then you kind of forget about it. So this beer started out as a malting project. Um, we had these old wine tanks and uh, you know, with uh, you know, the price of raw materials and this and that, we, we said to ourselves, look, like, why don't we try to make our own malt? So do you guys know how malt is made? You guys know the basic process? So the three, what are the three main steps of malting? Fermentation. Nope, that's second, what's first? Steeping, kilning, yes. Okay, so in a you know in a biological sense, you're you're starting the growth of the barley seed. So the the barley was actually not. Um, it doesn't grow up wanting to be a beer. It grows up wanting to be another barley plant. Um, so what you're doing is you're soaking the grain, which starts its life cycle, which releases the enzymes. It does a lot of things, um, and then. Anyway, so it has to take in the water. So Steve, so this is one of the old wine tanks. So we, it's these giant, like concrete vessels. Um, so we just we filled it up with some water and some grain, and we soaked the barley. You go there's a there's a series of steps. So you have to soak it. You've got to drain it to let it aerate. Soak it again. Um, so we did that all in the wine tank, and then we germinated, which is where the plant starts to grow. Um, releasing the enzymes, and then that, that's kind of a mission because we got to climb in the tank and we got to like stir, and it's like very laborious. Um, uh, so you kind of get this feel, it's what they call floor malting. So it's, for us it was very interesting because you get a very intimate relationship with the raw material, which for us as brewers is very exciting. Um, I know like when I was in brewing school, you know, you're learning all the theory and you're learning all this, um, you know, the science and the math and stuff, which is very, it's very cool, it's very exciting to kind of know the details of how these things happen, but it's only when you kind of go into the brewery and you start seeing these things come to life does the, the knowledge really come to life and the application. Um, and particularly as brewers, I, I know like SAB and stuff, you guys make your own malt, but as a craft brewery, you're generally not, you're not really getting exposed with like the malting process on this first hand level very much. Um, so I found it very exciting. It was a ton of work though, because then we had to dry them all, right? So, which is just basically shoving it out and then putting it out in the sun. And then it like takes forever. And so we have to like keep stirring it. And then we're like bringing it in and out of the sun. And then we toasted some over like a fire. It's a huge mission. Any kind of money we save like from like making our own malt is like not worth it at all because it, <laughs> it takes hours and hours. But it was a ton of fun and we learned a lot and it was really interesting. Um, and for us, that's, that's some of the things that we do. Like as a craft brewer, a lot of times you're following passion. You're following, you know, what is interesting to you as a brewer, what is exciting to you. And then you try to translate that to your drinker and say like, this beer is really cool, this is really exciting, let me tell you about this material, this process, um, or this style. Does that make sense? Um, because, you know, I think that's part of what craft brewing is about. It's about telling stories. It's about getting excited about ingredients and processes and styles. Um, so it's a very like intrinsic qualities of the beer. Um, yeah, so anyway, so then we, yeah, so we made, we, so then this batch was basically all our own malt, like the first batch that we did. Um, so we did kind of a traditional boil. Um, we did a kind of a traditional step mash because like in this type of malting, it's it's fairly uneven modification. Do you guys know what that means? Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So um, so it's like, uh, which is fitting for these types of beers because these wild fermented mixed culture beers, they kind of represent a type of brewing that um, is how people would have made a beer hundreds of years ago. So when we didn't have you know precise controls and measurements over these different things, so a lot of these like brewing traditional methods that we can follow they serve a purpose in that like, you know, making use of what raw material you had at the time. So like, uh, so we followed like a step mash, you know, protein rests and all that. And then what, what does help with these kind of beers is then you have a broad spectrum of carbohydrates for the secondary fermentation. 
So, um, okay, so back to the beer. So then fermentation takes place. Did I have a picture of the barrel? I should have had a picture of the barrel. So we have this big 500 liter barrel in the brewery that is, um, that's like the live culture barrel. Um, so we never actually pitch fresh yeast for any of these beers. We always empty it and then we just brew right back into it. So it's a little bit of a Solera type system. Um, so that there's this mixed culture that lives in the barrel that evolves with each batch. That's why it's called live culture, you know? Um, and we had an intern from Stelly's that like, he, um, he got it like plated and like, like, you know, measured all, and there's like dozens and dozens of yeast strains living into it. Um, so it's really fascinating to see like how that culture evolves with each batch. Um, so this one, what it basically does is Saccharomyces is still much stronger than like say, it's mainly we're talking about different strains of Britannomyces, wild yeast, um, lactobacillus, souring bacteria. Um, but then you still have a, a bunch of classes of brewer's yeast in there. And they're much stronger than the bread and the wild yeast. So they tend to dominate, let's say, in the first six months. And then that's really when the bread and the lactobacillus starts to take over. So you get the acidity. Um, you get these really nice, like, dry, peppery flavors to it. Um, yeah, so for me, like, on the palate, we get a lot of this uh, um, almost like champagne-like character. So you have a breadiness to it. Um, there's certainly the acidity, there's these dry, spicy notes, the uh, phenolic characters to it. Um, but then you also have a big fruit component, which is really like interesting. Um, so you get this kind of peach, this lemon, um, that really comes through, that matches the acidity very well. Um, so, you know, for us, anytime we're making a beer, like, we always start with like a big idea. Like, what's like the idea, you know? What's exciting? What's the inspiration? And for this beer, it's very much about the fermentation, about these wild yeasts, and about like making our own malt. Um, but then below that, you know, every beer has to be good. Does that make any sense? Like it has to taste good. And sometimes like, you know, I think more inexperienced breweries, like, you know, you get attached to an idea, you lose the forest from the trees. So every beer still has to be drinkable. It has to it still has to be pleasant on the palate. And for me, you achieve that through a sense of good structure and good balance. So there should be a beginning, a middle, and an end. And these flavors complement and work together and support each other. Um, so like an example, say for this beer, like if it become too dry or too acidic, like then it's heavy on the back end and you don't have enough like let's say fruit flavors in the beginning to balance that, then it's, gonna, it's not going to taste quite right. And then also vice versa. If you have a very fruit forward, sweet kind of beer, but you don't have, say, hot bitterness or like, you know, dry phenolic character or acidity to support those flavors, um, there's going to be kind of a flatness or a cloyingness um, that's going to not sit right on the palate. Yo. Hi, Nick. Uh, two questions. The one is, how did you start the live culture in that barrel? Was it there? Did you find it there? How, how did you sort of prep it for your first batch? And the second thing is, if you do get this imbalance in the beer, is there any way to adjust it? So yeah. can, you f can you fix it? Yeah, definitely. So um, we started with pitching um, different strains of bread. I don't think we pitched any lacto from the beginning. It was really like a few Belgian strains and a few Brett strains. And then, so the beginning, like say the first year, almost even two years, it was very Brett forward, like everything that came out of the barrel, and it was not acidic. And I remember thinking, like, I want some acidity to it. And then it, we actually did a, which is actually the next thing I'm gonna talk about, it's very good. Um, we did a traditional African beer. So we had this other project where we do traditional sorghum beer, which is very, um, got a lot of like acidity to it. And so then we did like a blending with it that played out well. And so then eventually like lacto got into the barrel, I think after about two years. Um, so now it's, it's almost like you, you worry about it, you know? Um, so that's the first question. The second question, um, you would blend pretty much like, y like, and that's where we have the kind of the whole library of, of barrels. So a lot of these mixed culture, wild fermented beers, um, really like the flavor only reaches that like, you know, world-class, like, amazing level through blending, you know. You would have these amazing, really bread forward beers that are very dry, very peppery, like, such, like, intense flavor. But 
you don't have enough on the front end, so it just it's very like dry. Um, or you might have like like we've got one barrel in the brewery that is like proper sour, like it is like hectic, but it's this beautiful like lactic like citrus acidity. But you you couldn't really just drink it on your own, you know. So that's a nice one to blend if we need some acidity. Um, so f so for these kind of projects, that that's really like how we approach it, you know. Um, cool. Everybody else good? Okay, cool. Um, do you guys like the beer? Yes. Cool. Okay, great. Yeah, cool. Okay, so then another, really, this is a very, like, pet project for us. This is the sorghum beer project. So do you guys know what Piwe from um, Tolakazi or Brewster's Craft, she was here yesterday or day before. So this is a little passion project that her and I collaborate on. I'm called Wild African Soul. Um, so it's really about trying to tell the story of traditional sorghum African beer and then the similarities between that brewing culture and say European or American style sour beers. Um, so it's really like what we'd normally do is we've done three batches so far, three editions. So we, we normally do it for South African National Beer Day or Heritage Day. Um, so we'll make a batch of traditional sorghum beer and then we'll strain it and we'll serve it at the pub, but then we'll also, we'll blend it in the barrel with one of our barrel beers and then let them do um, a secondary fermentation together. Um, so this is kind of like a picture of some of it. So the, the latest one, one of the base beers was this, um, uh, this beer that fermented directly in the, the oak barrels, like open fermentation. Um, and then this, this is another one where we, in, uh, we wanted to keep the acidity down on the sorghum beer, so we like dry hopped, um, we dry hopped it a lot with these Holcon hops, like so the, um, the hops inhibit lactobacillus. Um, so that was, yeah, so that's kind of an example of it. Um, but for me, this is another example of like, you know, most people don't get it. Like, they, like, they don't really like get this sorghum beer thing. Like, it's interesting. But for us, like, um, we want to try and tell that story and bring like that story of traditional African beer to like, you know, an audience that's never really been exposed to this. Um, it's really, it's, you know, I would say it's it's a realm that I like implore you guys to explore because traditional sorghum beer. It's really like it's a living beer culture that is unlike anything in the world. It is, it's because it's still alive today. It's still practiced like throughout South Africa, throughout Africa. But it's it's a type of brewing that is just like we would have made beer literally thousands of years ago, and we're still making beer just like it today, and that is amazing. Um, and so we kind of want to tell the story of those beers, and really bring that to a new audience. And you know, we're just doing it the way we know how, which is by making cool beer around it. You know. Um, so, okay, so then another beer that we get super passionate about uh, with these barrel-aged beers is this one called uh, Ale of Origin. So it's, it's what they call a traditional lambic type beer. So we take unmalted grains, um, we do what they call a spontaneous fermentation. So we go into one of the old wine tanks um, and we let the cool air overnight cool it down, which brings in yeast from the air, like from the fruit farms and everything. Um, and then it ferments in a single barrel. This batch took like four years, um, but then it's really like nice and sour, lots of fruit character to it. Um, yeah, aged hops, like it's, it's a very like traditional way of making beer, but we've kind of, um, it's got our own little imprint to it because of where we are, it's surrounded by the fruit farms. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so that's a picture of one of the wine tanks. Um, cool, you guys have questions, good. Yes. Um, so obviously you, you're doing wild fermentation. Have you had issues with uh, opportunistic infections and things like that? So I don't know what examples would be, but like E. coli or things like that that make your beer not food safe. Oh, um, no. And why? <laughs> no, it's, I mean, I think it's just because as brewers we, we kind of like uh, mostly like program no, 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 to no, no, see. No. Um, I'm asking you why. Why do you th why do you think we haven't had that type oh. of issue? Is it not possibly because you you're brewing in a place that's had for such a long time been exposed to yeasts and things that are used within the wine industry? 
that maybe that's the reason why? Not really. So um, beer itself is a naturally food safe product. It's got low pH, it's anaerobic, it's um, got hops, um, it's got alcohol, it's got bitterness. These things naturally inhibit most, if not all, pathogens. So that's the one thing like, um, which is very comforting to us as brewers, I think, like, you know, throughout history, throughout history, really, um, that beer itself is, is naturally food safe. It might not taste great, but it's not going to kill you, you know? So, um, yeah. Did that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah, cool, cool. I was trying to quiz you there, because that's like something, <laughs> like, you know, as a brewer, it's a good, it's a good thing to know, yeah. For this one, yes. Yeah, so this is a very, like, lambic, do you guys know what lambics are? Yeah, so it's a very, um, sometimes uh, there, there is a little bit of confusion around lambic or not. So lambic itself is a very specific type of sour beer, if you can call it that way. So not all barrel-aged sour beer is considered a lambic, um, according to the traditional definition. Um, so it, it's actually technically... We couldn't call our beer lamb because it's not brewed in Belgium. So, like, but the, we would say lambic style or whatever. You know, uh, it's like champagne, um, but that it follows a very traditional method of production, which is unmalted grains, turbid mash, aged hops, spontaneous fermentation in a single barrel, um, and then you can kind of consider it brewed according to traditional lambic methods. Um, you know, that's a good example of the the really fascinating thing about you know, the blending of art and science of beer, and that, like, this is a very artistic beer that the Belgian brewers are very protective of. Um, I think rightfully so, because it was a beer that almost died in the 70s or so, and you had a few, a handful of guys that were, like, very passionate about it, and they preserved it. Now it's, it's popular globally, um, but it, you know, it wasn't always the case. Um, so, yeah, sorry. What? Sorry, guys. Yep. Right. You wanna finish first, and then we can have some questions? Yeah, cool, yeah, yeah, cool. Um, that sounds good. Um, where was I? I'm rambling a little bit here, but um, yeah. So anyway, so I'm just trying to kind of explain like some of the things that we get excited about. Um, uh, for you guys as brewers, um, kind of something what Letu was saying, like really like follow your curiosity, follow your passion. Um, you know, go down paths that you just find interesting and tell the story of that brewery and learn the learn the stories of the beers. Um, these are some of the other things that we have. We've got a, um, a traditional German fest beer. We've got like, you know, like that we constantly do. So like one of the big focus points for us is to really keep coming up with new ideas and keep coming up with new beers. There's probably one or two new beers literally every month because that's we want to share that with people. We want to help them explore the world of beers. Um, and so this, you know, we've got saisons that have you know, uh, lavender from the garden. We've got a 13% barrel aged stout. Um, we've got a 10% triple IPA. Um, this lager of origin beer is, you guys have actually a relevance to because Liquid Culture Lab here, um, they isolated this um, lager yeast strain and we used it to ferment that. So it's like 100% South African ingredients. So local hops, um, some of the malt that we made, um, and then this lager yeast. Um, so, yeah, so I would say kind of, you know, my overall message to you guys is the next generation and the future of brewing in South Africa is um, be proud of who you are and um, be proud of br your beer and the community that you're entering. Um, uh, don't be afraid to ask for help and introduce yourselves. It's, it's a very small little world, like beer, even like in the States, like, there's not that many people, you know, like, so it's, it's a very camaraderie. It's a, it's a very close knit industry. Um, but really like for us, we, it's about telling stories. Like we want to, you know, share the world of beer with South Africans. We want to expose them to these types of beers that they would have never been exposed to. We don't want you to have to travel to Europe or travel to America to taste like these amazing beers. We want you to be able to have this beer right here in South Africa and be proud of it and say, you know what, this is just as good as anything I can get anywhere. Um, and I, I think I put that to you guys, like, let's build this thing together. Let's make South Africa known throughout the world for making some of the most amazing beer and unique beer that's unique to us and is unlike anything else in the world. And that's the mission that I'm on and that a lot of these people in this room are on. Um, and so, you know, join us. <laughs> so anyway, okay, cool, all right.
Oh yeah, Nick. What is aged hops, and why does it not smell like cheese? They do smell like cheese. <laughs> well, eventually, like if they they kind of air out enough, so they don't smell like cheese. You, you drive off essentially most of the essential oils, and then you're just kind of what you end up doing, like from a brewing standpoint, is you're just adding oxidized beta acids. So most of the IB the alpha acids break down, and the essential oils go. But then, which adds some preservative character, but it doesn't inhibit lacto. If you like, uh, from a technical standpoint, yeah. And then also, like, if the, any kind of like essential oil hop flavor or aroma is going to age out over four years, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, may I please ask, um, how do you get it so sour? Because it's the most, I don't know, most sour beer that I've ever tasted. So, how did you. Yeah. Did you lower the pH or. To uh, you kind of just wait. Like uh, so, <laughs> one of the things that after the primary fermentation, the bread will continue to work, so it will dry the beer out completely, um, and you'll start to get these dry flavors. But then the lacto will keep going. When I say lacto, I'm referring to lactobacillus, which is like a souring bacteria. Um, uh, and so you generally are almost just waiting. Like if I want a barrel to be a little more sour. Like I know it's, it's gonna kinda keep going in that direction. When it goes too far, it gets too sour or then eventually it will just turn to vinegar. Um, but yeah, which is what you wanna avoid in these types of beers, like when you're making these. Um, um, so um, how, long, how long did you age this beer? Cause it is, yeah, it is, it is, very, it is very nice and yeah. it is, Particularly sour. I love I love the sour. Do you? Da -da -da -da. Nice man. Thanks. Yeah, so, yeah. um, how long? How long did you? So uh, this, for this mince. beer took. Um, it was about eighteen months. But the trick is, you know, the barrel was ripe and ready. Like you really, you have to have like a good culture, which is really hard to just pick up off the shelf and make. Like, like I said, when we first started making these beers, like they were very dry. But I wanted some acidity. It was only like later that the acidity started coming in. I was like, wow, this is like so good, you know? Um, the other thing, like if you want to kind of make a beer like this, like tomorrow, or, you know, and you don't have, you don't have these barrels to age, it's very hard on a Humber scale because you need the surface area of like, let's say a 225 wine barrel. But like, obviously that's a lot of beer for like a home brewer, you know? Like, and then, you, and then you, that barrel might not even be that good, you know? Like, so, um, there are many ways to skin a cat. Like, traditionally, a lot of people would kind of say, oh, this long-term barrel aging thing is really what's most complex and best. Like, that's kind of one school of thought, but you do have a lot of yeast strains these days. You have access to different types of lactobacillus that you can make kind of quicker fermentations with. So, um, I would say experiment. Like, there, there's a lot of different new ways to make acidity in a beer, to make lactobacillus, to make these tart flavors. Um, if you don't want to, you know, have to wait for three years, um, and then maybe it not even work, you know. Does that make sense? Am I answering the question? Like, I don't want to tell you no. It's impossible. Like, I would say explore different yeast strains and different lactobacillus fermentations, and then, uh, you know, give yourself when you're building the experiment, give yourself room to blend because that's really, I think, where you're gonna you're gonna get the result. Oh, Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. What's a turbid mash? Oh, um, turbid mash. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. So it's a super like hectic way of mashing that is kind of traditional to these Belgian lambic type beers. So you I still have a picture. No, no picture. Um, you essentially, the goal is to get a wort with a broad spectrum of different carbohydrates, which includes long chain starch carbohydrates. So essentially what you're doing is you mill, you would add like a little bit of water. So it's literally like damp uh, grist. And then you would, you take like a pull of what they call like the turbid pull. So it's like starchy. It's not mashed yet because it's so cold. Mm. Mashing is breakdown of starch into sugar. So you, so you have like this starch liquid and then you would pull it off, heat it up. Um, so you're not going through the mashing temperatures. Um, so then you've got like this starch wort and then you kind of keep adding wort and you take these turbid pulls that are different ranges of carbohydrates and then you add that back to the boil and then you boil for like four hours then you 
yeah, so because you're you want to leave food for the slower acting uh, microorganisms, you know, essentially the bread and the lacto. Um, otherwise, because the Saccharomyces is much stronger, much like more dominant to these these longer surviving yeasts, um, so you have to leave something for them too, you know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I know like with barrels, they're not really kind of airtight, so mm. they allow like evaporation. And I think in mm. Belgium, they call it the angel's share. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, you said you left for four years. Did you like, did you not lose like quite a lot of beer in that process? Or did you top it up? What did you use to top it up with? Yeah, so that's, that's very much part of the process is like this evaporation. Um, what generally happens is a, I don't have a picture. See, this would be a good thing to put it. There, um, what they call a pellicle forms on top yeah. of the barrel, which is a, the bread forms this yeast layer. Um, it looks like an alien. It's really mm -hmm. cool. You guys should Google pellicle. Um, but, but that kind of um, blocks the oxygen. Okay. I th you know, I think it must slow down the evaporation rate, but that does happen. But this beer, we didn't top it up. So, like, okay, so we'd okay. lost a certain amount, you know. Okay, so it wasn't like a huge amount. Mm -hmm. It was significant, it okay. you know. I want to. I just don't remember off the top of my head. It was, yeah. I mean, dude, it's probably at least twenty percent. You know, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, I mean, because it, it's it's evaporating. Like it goes over time. Obviously the, the fears with the oxygen, the acetic acid could. Yeah, exactly. So so there's you know, there's different schools of thought to it. Um, some people like to top up the barrels to keep them full. Um, but while you're topping up, you are breaking the pellicle, which does expose it to oxygen. So, like, um, some of the some of the barrels we top up, some of them we don't. It okay. just depends on what we're getting in the barrel. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, um, but it's yeah. There's do there's different schools of thought to it. Okay, it's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sorry. Cool. Any Anyone else? Cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, but yeah, you guys. <laughs> Sure, yeah, yeah. Are the beers pasteurized? No. Not at yeah, all. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you, yeah, if you want to try and grow up what's in the bottle, maybe that's an idea. Um, 